All right, my last pre-lab lecture, and if you've made it this far, I congratulate you. Um, here's the issue. Lewis structures are two-dimensional drawings. They're two-dimensional representations of molecules. What shape do molecules form in three dimensions, right? And the model that we use to describe that is called VESPER, valence shell electron pair repulsion theory. Here's the basic premise of VESPER. It says electrons like to be as far apart as possible. Right? In other words, electrons adopt a 3D geometry in a way that minimizes the interactions between pairs. And one of the old textbooks I had had a nice example of that. If I imagined um, grabbing four balloons right, together in the middle and pinching them, the balloons would spontaneously arrange in this kind of shape so that they were as far apart as possible. If I pinched them in the middle, this is the shape they would form. Electrons do exactly the same thing. And the specific shape that they take would depend on how many balloons were involved. So if there were only two, it would be a linear arrangement. Um, if there were three, it would be something different. If there were five, it would be something like this. And it turns out that there are actually a total of, of um, five different shapes. The, the linear arrangement isn't shown here, but um, these are the, at least four of the different three-dimensional shapes that molecules can take. And they have specific names, trigonal planar, tetrahedral, um, trigonal bipyramid, or octahedral. So how do we figure this out? Um, well, what you have to do is count something called effective electron pairs. The number of effective electron pairs determines the 3D arrangement of electrons. Uh, here's how you count effective pairs. A lone pair of electrons counts as one effective pair. And any chemical bond counts as one effective pair. Doesn't matter if it's single bond, double bond, triple bond, any chemical bond uh, counts as a, as a effective pair. So let me give you a couple of examples. Uh, SF6. I drew the Lewis structure before. It looks like this. CO2. Looks like this and water, H2O, uh, oxygen. Looks like this. So how do I count effective pairs? Uh, here we go. Any chemical bond counts as one effective pair. So one, two, three, four, five, six. Six effective pairs. Um, in this one, right, again, any chemical bond counts as effective pairs. So there's one double bond here and one double bond here. That counts as two effective pairs. And one thing that I wanted to make clear is that when you count effective pairs, you only count it for the central atom, right? The place where you're gripping all those things in the middle. Uh, water, it's got two bonds, right? that's two, and it has two lone pairs, so it has four effective pairs, right? That's the accounting. Once you do that, what you're gonna do in short is pull up this chart, which is on page 113 of your lab manual, right? and you will look at the different uh, effective electron pair geometry this column here for different numbers. Uh, so again, two is a linear arrangement, three is trigonal planar, four is tetrahedral, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. When you um, decide that, then what you need to do is count up the number of bonding pairs and lone pairs. Uh, so let me give you an example, what I mean by that again.
Come on. Here's water. Where'd my pen go? Here it is. Uh, we said it has four effective pairs. But if I describe those a little further, I will note that it has two bonding pairs. And it has one, two, two lone pairs. So when I go into this chart right, uh, and look at it. It has four effective pairs, two pairs of bonding electrons, two pairs of lone pair electrons. It forms a bent arrangement. If I compare that to something like ammonia, ammonia has this structure. Uh, it also has four effective pairs. But if I look at this arrangement, it now has three bonding pairs and one lone pair. So ammonia um, will form this arrangement, a trigonal planar arrangement. And one of the things you're gonna have to do is go through this lab and describe the molecular geometry of different molecules. Okay. I think this is what I just talked about, molecular geometry. The molecular geometry um, can be different than the electron geometry. I'm not gonna go into this. Um, you can read about it in your textbook if you want. There are slight deviations from ideal geometry because lone pair electrons are bulkier than bonding pair electrons. And so you often have to figure out where um, they're gonna go and you wanna stick bonding electrons further apart, as far apart as possible. Um, I'm not gonna get all the way into these details because it won't matter for today's lab, but a good thing to know. Another thing that the lab report is going to ask you is the hybridization. Uh, so the idea here is that unpaired electrons in, in an atomic orbital can form a covalent bond. Uh, and in order to form enough bonds to satisfy the octet and to do so in the right geometry, atomic orbitals hybridize. They form hybrid orbitals. So to hybridize means that you're going to mix and match different amounts of S, P, and D orbitals to form new hybrid orbitals. And I'm going to cut right to the chase here for you. Um, the lab report will ask you to identify the hybridization of the central atom. And in order to do that, what you are going to do is to look at the effective pair geometry and associate that with the specific hybridization. Um, so again, this chart is page 114, but if you have a effective pair geometry of two, you are in an SP hybridization. Um, that means it's one S orbital and one P orbital. Three is SP2, one S orbital and two P orbitals, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. One last issue, polarity. Uh, you will be asked to identify whether or not a molecule is polar. And it, it turns out that there are two things that you need to know. Um, so in order to have a polar molecule, you need to have differences in electronegativity. Right? Electronegativity refers to an atom's ability to pull electron towards itself. You may recall that the most electronegative atoms are the ones in the upper right, right? fluorine. Um, and if you have two atoms with a difference in electronegativity, that can cause what's caused, called a bond dipole. Right? That is an unequal distribution of charge along the bond. In HF, it's pulling the electrons towards the fluorine. <clears throat> However, the presence of bond dipoles is not sufficient to determine whether or not a molecule is polar. 
The reason is that dipoles are vectors, bond dipoles are vectors. That is, they have a magnitude and a direction. And if I have one atom, which is pulling electrons this way, and another atom pulling electrons this way, those would be equal and opposite, and they'd cancel one another, right? So they're vectors. And in order to figure out whether or not a molecule is overall polar, you have to consider the vector sum of individual dipoles. Here's a quick example of that. Um, it's a series of substituted uh, hydrocarbons. So here's methane, here's carbon tetrachloride, and then in between we have you know, one chlorine, two chlorines, three chlorines, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Which molecules in here are polar? Well, the first thing you need to ask is, is carbon chlorine, um, is there a bond dipole there? Is there an electronegativity difference between carbon and chlorine? And the answer is yes, right, there is. Uh, chlorine is considered electronegative, it's far to the right. Carbon is considered neutral. And so, uh, in effect, electrons are being pulled from the carbon towards the chlorine. Um, because methane has no chlorines, it is clearly not polar. Uh, this molecule, and I can't think of its name right now, but with one chlorine, it clearly is polar, right? Um, and you might say, well, one chlorine is good, two chlorines is also polar, right? Three chlorines is also polar, They're pulling this way. Four chlorines must be really great. But if you look at this, you will realize that these molecules are all pulling in equal and opposite directions, right? In other words, the vector sum of all of those dipoles is zero. And so this one is not polar. The bottom line is when you have polar molecules, you'll often detect an asymmetry. Right? And that's what you should look for. Uh, not all asymmetric molecules are polar, but all polar molecules are associated with some sort of asymmetry. Right? That's what I just said. Good. Um, don't work in Paris. I don't know why I put this in here. Right? You have been assigned a group of molecules from um, page 116, those are up on Canvas, so make sure that you look at this. Right? You're going to draw Lewis structures, you're going to predict hybridization and molecular geometries. Uh, when you do that, include formal charge and draw all major resonance structures that may exist. Uh, one last thing, in the olden days we used to give students a model kit so they could build these things and investigate shape. We can't do that in a remote context. Uh, but there is this really nice simulation of these effects. Um, and uh, let me see if I can figure out how to show this to you, but, but um, I will put the link up in Canvas. And it looks something like this. Right? Um, so here's this, this simulation. It's from the University of Colorado my old alma mater. And the purple atom here is a central atom. Right? What you can do is you can click and you can add different arrangements to it and it will um, draw these in three-dimensional space. Right? So you can click and you can add on different arrangements. Um, you can click molecules and you'll find out that this is trigonal planar. Right? has a trigonal planar geometry. I can click and add lone pairs to it, um, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. You can do this for fake molecules that you build. You can also do it for real molecules if you wanna play around with it. So this might be another nice tool um, at your disposal. All right, I'm gonna stop here. If you have questions, shoot me an email. Um, good luck and we'll see you soon.